Good evening. I'd like to call to order the August meeting of the Monroe County Public Library Board of Trustees. To begin, we'll go around and introduce ourselves, and if you care to, share something you're reading or listening to or a game you're playing. Chris, we'll start with you. Oh, and um, I'm actually listening to, oh, it's not, this is my iPad. Duke, I think is the name. <laughs> I don't always remember the names of stories, I'm sorry. And then Liddy is a book I'm starting to read. I was told it was a good historical fiction. I am Kari Essery, and I'm reading The Covenant of Water. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah, it's great. I'd highly recommend it. I'm Greer Carson. I'm reading On Photography by Susan Sontag from some time ago. And we just started playing Black Myth Wukon because it came out yesterday. I'm Chris Harrison, and I'm currently reading Capture the Flag by Kate Messner. And I finished reading um, Heroes by Alan, or listening to Al Heroes by Alan Gratz, but I'm waiting for a few of my holds to come through so I can listen to something new. Wonderful. Nichelle Wash reading The Four Pivots, Reimagining Justice and Reimagining Ourselves by Sean A. Ginwright. I'm Amy O'Shaughnessy, um, and I'm reading When We Were Birds, um, which is by Ayana Louis Bonwell. All right, thank you. So the first item on our agenda tonight is the consent agenda items. Do we have a motion to approve the minutes from the July 17th board meeting, the monthly financial report, the monthly bills for payment, personnel report and the board meeting calendar. Second. Okay. Any questions or comments regarding these items? Uh, I will point out that it says June 17th instead of July in the minutes, so we will correct that before we complete these. Okay. Seeing none, all those in favor of approving the consent agenda items signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. The ayes have it. Next, we're going to hear from Greer with the director's monthly report. All right. Well, first, I'd like to thank our director of public services, Josh Wolf, for sitting at this table for the past two months. Uh, July saw an uptick in most of our patron visit circulation and program attendance numbers. That's not too surprising, given that it was the height of summer reading, and we have an extensive catalog of programs, but it is worth noting. Similarly, our overall collection use is up for the third straight month. Again, summer reading has a lot to do with this, particularly with regard to physical item circulation, but our digital co uh, collection use has remained steady since April and saw a notable increase in July. Our Ellettsville programs have been very popular with a pair of programs uh, drawing far more attendees than expected. And the teen space saw an unusually high number of uh, patrons for the summer months. Normally we see a little bit of a lull, so that was great. During a recent power outage, our staff here downtown did a fabulous job improvising and arranged movie screenings for patrons who were in here sheltering from the storm. So thanks to children's librarian Reagan Zelaya in particular for putting this together. We have had such a strong show of support for our Southwest Branch reopening. Patrons share their joy and appreciation on a daily basis. And once again, we thank them and everyone in the community for their patience and understanding uh, as we work through this challenging time. We are still closing out some purchase orders with insurance for replacement furniture and some remaining punch list items related to floor and or electrical fixes. And so we're still awaiting that final subrogation report, which can't come until we're done closing out all of those purchase orders. We are excited to be live with Paylocity. This is our new HRIS system. Um, it's a system that replaces UKG for payroll and time management, but also two other systems related to hiring and performance management. We now have punch-in kiosks, which are basically mounted iPads at both the downtown library staff entrances to make daily clocking in and out for hourly staff much easier, and we're installing similar kiosks at both branches. The transition from UKG to Paylocity has been very smooth, thanks to Becky, Mark, and Lauren and their implementation and training efforts from Human Resources. Our new online catalog, which we had shared with you all a few months ago, it's called Vega Discover. It will launch in October. This is later than we expected because we hit an implementation snag this summer due to some data transfer issues with Polaris, which is our ILS. And we are committed to ensuring that the catalog functions exactly as it should before we turn it on for the public. 
ILS coordinator Christine Sneed has led this project and will present at our September board meeting to give you all a sneak peek of Vega Discover and talk about the launch plans and the marketing campaign for the public before it goes live in October. And as always, happy to answer any questions about the report. I was just curious with your work with the other Indiana Library Directors and the State Library to draft um, some new changes to the Indiana Code's current definition of library services. Can, are there any highlights that you can share with us? Or? Sure. The, the, the biggest goal of the group so far has been to make sure that the diversity of programs and services that public libraries offer in the 21st century is somehow um, captured in the language that exists in the Indiana Code. Right now, it really talks about books and collection development, uh, reference assistance and reader's advisory, you know, sort of the traditional pieces of public library services, um, but it doesn't accurately reflect everything that libraries do or could do. And of course, we are more of a third space now. Our service model is quite flexible, and by us, I mean all public libraries. Um, so when legislators talk about making changes to the way library budgets are overseen and approved, it's very important that the Indiana Code accurately describes what public libraries do today versus what they did 30 or 40 years ago. And so we're working together to draft some proposed language changes just to have in case we want to take it to the state legislature and kind of lobby for adopting some of those changes next year or the year after. And a lot of that depends on what happens in the state legislature. Yeah. Any other questions or comments for Greer? This is not related to anything that you've shared, but just an FYI, because I am obsessed with the Southwest branch, and it's amazing. The staff there, superb. One thing I will say from a functional experience, I don't know if we can do this, but if we could have adapters that allow for the HDMI cord going from the monitor to connect to different types of devices in that conference room. And then also, like some sort of station or something where you can sit your device, because right now you have to extend that HDMI cord across to the table. So that can kind of be a little wonky if you have people sitting at that conference table. Yeah. yeah. Pretty easy things for us to okay. take a look at. Yeah, thank you. Okay, good. Then I'll plug even more. All right. <laughs> Motivation. All right. Next, we'll move on to our old business. We have a couple of action items here, uh, but the first one is a draft approval to advertise the 2025 budget. So do we have a motion to approve this draft so budget? Second. Gary, if you'll just share with us a little more about our budget for next year. Uh, last month, we went over the first draft of the 2025 budget. An updated version of the budget is included in the board packet starting on page 89. The public notice for the budget is on page 91. We went over budget numbers last month, so I will mainly focus on the public notice approval tonight. But if there are any questions on the details of the 2025 budget report, I'd be happy to go over. The next step in the budget process is to post the budget notice uh, to taxpayers in Gateway, which is the state information, uh, state budget information website. The notice to taxpayers provides the public hearing date and time, which will be at the September 18 board meeting and it'll be at the Southwest Branch. The public notice also provides the adoption meeting information. Uh, the budget adoption will occur at the October 16 board meeting here at the main branch. The 2025 budget estimate showing on the notice is about $13,263,000. This includes the allocation for spending in the operating fund, along with the debt fund and the rainy day budget. The property tax levy for 2025 is estimated to be about, it's to be $8,867,844, 
split between the operating fund and the debt fund. The current year tax levy is about 8510000 So are there any questions on this budget notice? Any questions for Gary? Okay, seeing none, all those in favor of approving the advertisement of the 2025 draft budget signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. The ayes have it. Next, Gary is going to share with us a resolution for surplus items. Do we have a motion to approve the resolution to surplus some items? So moved. Second. Okay. okay. I will start this resolution around. All right. Um, so th this is, uh, uh, um, we have a couple of old uh, MacBooks, and then we have some other items, uh, furniture items, that we're, we're really just trying to get rid of some clutter. So uh, that's, that's all that's going on with this resolution. Any questions? So the, the two very worn sofas are probably so worn that they cannot be nicely used anywhere else, correct? That is my understanding. <laughs> okay, very worn. That's, yeah. yeah, for yeah sometimes that happens. Yeah. <laughs> All those in favor of approving the resolution to surplus some property, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. The ayes have it. Okay. Next, we have one item for new business, and that is a collection development policy update. Do we have a motion to approve the collection development policy updates? Okay, and then we'll have Lisa Champelli come up to describe some of these changes. Hello, good evening. Uh, so the collection development policy uh, serves to help inform our community and our staff about some of the guiding principles and criteria that we consider when we're adding materials to the collection. Uh, because libraries, communities, and our collections are evolving on a continual basis, uh, we aim to review this annually and make any uh, updates accordingly. We did do a comprehensive review of the collection devel development policy last year um, uh, with input from other departments. Um, and this was done in conjunction with updating our procedures for how we handle requests for reconsideration. Uh, so we didn't do uh, any kind of major uh, uh, review and, and update comprehensively again this year, but members of the content development department did have some suggestions for edits and revisions, and we brought those to Greer and our leadership team and are bringing to you now for approval. Um, so I'm happy to kind of go through the different changes if you like. Um, uh, you know, we're always wrestling with how to how best to show where the edits occurred. Um, so I'm, I can go through those uh, pretty quickly. Um, at the very top, uh, we added the statement articulating that MCPL analyzes collection needs uh, systemically across all library locations, including three branch buildings and outreach services. And this was this addition was kind of precipitated uh, to acknowledge that we have a whole new location with the Southwest Branch, as well as helping people understand that when we're looking at our collections and the and the and the types of materials and quantity that we make available, that we're really looking across the system, um, and and really see uh, where those items live at each location are really shared by everyone, no matter which location you might prefer to use. Um, so that's the first change. <laughs> uh, second, we replaced uh, the word read with the word use in the statement affirming the rights of all individuals to choose whether or not to use MCPL collections and to form their own opinions about the resources we use. And that change was uh, meant to just kind of be inclusive, recognizing that we have materials that you read, that you view, that you, uh, you know, play with. Uh, so it was just to kind of cover all of those things. Uh, the next change, we took out the reference to promotional purposes uh, so that it doesn't seem to contradict um, uh, 
our, our belief that we don't show approval or disapproval for particular materials. We certainly make recommendations. We uh, promote discovery of materials uh, th or, or specific titles through book lists, but we're not you know, promoting uh, a particular, you know, this is best, uh, you know, ab above others kind of thing. So that, that was the reasoning for taking that out. And then we had, uh, I think, just kind of a grammatical change to sentence structure um, in the section uh, uh, about scope of the collection, uh, recognizing that that includes reading levels in different formats. And then after that, in the section uh, referencing purchase, that we purchased digital media and subscriptions, that was just moved down from kind of the first paragraph uh, in the part articulating the scope of the collection. Uh, we had some discussion about adding some more descriptive information about e-library collections, um, but we hesitated to add anything else at this time just to, you know, so we didn't make the policy too, too much longer. And then under the section about selection of diverse and inclusive materials, we're recommending moving away from describing our collection as balanced and instead uh, recognizing uh, that we aim to be representational. And this change was really um, kind of advised in part by um, a univers uh, professor um, of library science. I can't remember exactly where she teaches now, but her name is Emily Knox, and she's an expert in intellectual freedom issues, and she was a, our keynote speaker at Staff Day uh, uh, last September. And you know, she just kind of pointed out that Libraries aren't doing a one-for-one -one kind of, you know, a balance of I have this subject, I'm going to have that one, or I've got this viewpoint, I'm going to have the opposing viewpoint. It's really meant to be representational. You know, are we providing different perspectives, different voices, um, and, and not, you know, having it be a one-for-one -one kind of thing. Under selection criteria, uh, we're seeking just to kind of correct a combining of criteria bullet, bullet points that we made last year, uh, which inadvertently replaced uh, attention from critical media reviewers with recommendations. And we want to reinstate attention. Um, and while we're always looking you know, to get the best of the best for our community and, and looking for those good positive recommendations of materials, a lot of time we're going to purchase things because it's, it's getting a lot of notoriety and it's what people want. They want to be part of the conversation about what is everybody else talking about. This is getting a lot of attention. I want to learn about it too. Um, so that, that's the reason for that change. Um, and then at, we added to criteria just kind of an acknowledgement that how much space we have to shelve things also plays a role in the decision making about what to add or not. Um, let's see. Oh, and the last change was uh, under collection maintenance and review. We're recommending using the word relevance instead of need since the selectors have to weigh you know, a number of criteria. Everybody, we you know if, somebody, if, a, if a community member is asking us for something, we know they need it, we know they want it, but we have to weigh other criteria in that decision making. So replacing need with relevance um, just kind of helped uh, describe that process a little bit closer. So those are the changes. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Thank you. All right, thank you. Great changes. Want to better understand what determines relevance. Is that back to the attention of what is popular? Yeah, I think it's just to, to help um, explain that a selector, if they're presented with a request to buy something or a suggestion, um, you know, that presents a need, uh, but they're having to weigh, well, how does this title, how does it relate to our collection development policy? How does it relate to um, what others have been asking for? How does it relate to what we may already have in the collection that, that provides representation on this topic? Um, yeah, those sort of things. Relevance can also speak to potential popularity. We do get a lot of patron requests that are um, niche, 
and very interesting and mm -hmm. have the potential to be popular among other patrons, but often are not. Mm -hmm. And we certainly don't like to purchase something uh, for addition to our collection and then find that it checks out once or twice. Mm -hmm. um, so that consideration that Lisa was describing yeah. really comes into play with a lot of patron requests. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I see that you're going to um, be talking about content development, so I just have a few questions about general content development, so you may answer them in that. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, uh, when I speak next? <laughs> All right. Thank you. I'll wait for those questions. <laughs> you may already know. Okay. All right. So do we have a motion to approve the updates to the collection development policy? Some All right. I'm sorry. We already moved. I'm sorry. sorry. We, we have to vote on it. <laughs> All those in favor of approving the updates to the collection development policy signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed nay. The ayes have it. All right, and next we will have uh, Steph Niemeyer come up to talk about circulation services. Welcome, Steph. All right, Ooh, sorry. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Steph Niemeyer, the circulation services manager, and I've been in some iteration of this role since I was hired in 2019. It's changed a little bit since then. Uh, circulation Services has survived summer reading. Uh, we're finally catching up on the mountain of returns that we always see between June and August, and while the total number of carts to be shelved is still higher than we'd like, we're not stressing too much about it. We're hoping to be able to resume our shelf maintenance projects soon, like shelf reading, um, shifting, because we know that when we can't keep up with those, the library gets messy. Bad things happen when the library is messy. And aside from the busyness of summer reading, our work has stayed relatively consistent. Every day comes with its new challenges, but the bulk of what we do in CERC remains the same. Um, we continue to collect, check in, organize, inventory, shelve, pull and find materials each day. And I want to highlight a bit about how MCPL Circulation Services Department differs from some of our peer libraries. CERC services here is largely the back of house maintenance of the collection rather than including the folks who check items out to patrons and do that kind of front-facing, um, interfacing. None of my staff are front-facing staff, um, although because they are out in the stacks, they do often do a certain amount of customer service here and there. Cirque Services Downtown is responsible for all the physical item movement, including that movement between branches, excuse me, between branches of every item returned. We have an automated sorting machine. With the Linkso model was installed in 2019, which we run about 75 hours each week. My staff are sometimes scheduled before we open to the public, and from the minute they come in to the minute that we all leave at closing, we're running items through that sorter. From mid-July to mid-August, we ran 82,955 items through our sorter from the staff induction and then stuff that came in from the drive-up patron side. So if my math checks out, that's more than 2,500 items a day that we're running through our sorter. It's getting a lot of really good use. CERC Services is a department of 29 employees, soon to be 33, with 20 materials handlers, four of them working 25 hours weekly, and 16, soon to be 20, working 15 hours weekly. We also have seven part-time circulation leads and two full-time circulation technicians. The materials handlers are responsible for most item movement, including shelving carts, running our AMH, or sorter, as we call it, organizing items from the sorted bins onto carts or to their final destination, and then also finding requested items in the stacks. They shelf read, they do shifting, and then general tidying up of the library as well. They bring issues that they find to me and also to the cir circulation leads, and they help to serve as the eyes for how the stacks are doing, whether they're getting too full, too messy, or have other issues. They keep me well informed. Circulation leads help with doing the same work as materials handlers, and they, as well as they have their own daily, weekly, and monthly tasks to tend to, such as leading our daily shift meetings, printing daily pull lists and reports, and then also ensuring that they get completed. They clean our AMH monthly, the inventory collections monthly, and maintain our Indiana room shelving. They also serve as the go-to for questions from many departments, and they help me to keep the department running smoothly by maintaining a holistic view of each day's responsibilities. They ensure that we finish everything that we need to complete that day. Another large part of the circulation leads responsibilities is handling any pests that we find within returned items, and I'll touch more on that a little bit later. They have a big role to play with that. 
it's hard to succinctly describe the variety of work that the circulation leads do because they do so much for both the department and the library as a whole. Circulation technicians handle the processing of damaged items or items with missing parts, processing of lost items, and charging patron accounts. They handle the check-in and maintenance of our library of things collection, as well as problem items. They search for missing items to fulfill our in interlibrary loan requests, and they complete an inventory of all of our other collections, as well as to help the department run keeping, as well as to help keep the department running smoothly in the absence of leads or myself. Again, it's difficult to succinctly describe exactly what they do because there's always something new and weird for them to deal with. I mentioned that I'm gonna be adding a few more staff, which is an exciting time in circulation. One of my favorite parts about hiring new staff is being able to help people develop their love for libraries. Because our materials handler position is one of our most entry level positions, I get the honor of teaching some new staff how to job in addition of how to do their job. I hire people with no prior job experience up to people who have retired from their careers, so it's quite a varied and dynamic group. And they never stop challenging me to keep growing my own management skills. And I'd also like to share a few projects that we've completed this year. Circulation projects, as you might imagine, take a lot of collaboration between not only CERC and content development, but really every department in the library. Uh, as we start to mess with collections, everyone notices. In January of this year, I started a project with the end goal of helping our second floor adult new arrivals area. I had been seeing less browsing and general interest in that space. So I brainstormed with some colleagues about how to shift various collections around, um, brainstorming mostly with Lisa as well, to increase attention to not only those new arrivals, but to a few different collections. Once we finished all the various collection moves and added some more seating in that new arrivals area, I've been happy to see more people browsing and checking out our new arrivals, uh, our new materials, as well as some of the other collections that we've moved. So they've been getting more notice, which is really nice. Once our adult collection ships were complete, Lisa and I jumped into another big project, which was a two-parter. One, to integrate our Jay Holiday collection back into those items home collections, and then two, to create space for a few of our ever-growing and ever-popular children's collections. We used the space created from integrating Holiday to move Jay graphic novels and manga to more shelves, which was a big improvement to those collections. We've heard a lot of good feedback from our children's staff. We then used the space from that shift to we then use the space from that to shift juvenile fiction, first chapter, and early reader items to try to give our EJ Picture Books collection more space, which feels like a Sisyphean task because those books are so popular, we can't make enough space for them on the shelves. While working on all of these big collection shifts, my circulation leads were also working with me to help further develop our internal processes to control pests from becoming a problem at MCPL. As I mentioned before, circ leads are responsible for handling any pests that we find. They've also helped to create and constantly fine tune our prevention and mitigation processes, which have proven to work time and time again, and we're all extremely grateful for that. We figured out not only how to keep pests from becoming an issue, but how to share information with all of our staff, as well as with patrons who ask without causing a panic, and have implemented a variety of preventative measures to ensure that we're doing all that we can to control the uncontrollable. And I really can't be prouder of the leads, both current and former, and their efforts and their help with this. A less visible but equally as important project that we resumed this year and isn't one that has an end date really is inventory. So inventory in collections allows us to find things that are missing, misshelved, or just otherwise weird. My circulation technicians have been working on our adult nonfiction and adult CD collections. And we just completed a full inventory of our Indiana room with, within which Alicia scanned a total of 7,934 materials on those shelves, and we're excited for the next step of catalog cleanup so that we're ensuring our online catalog is correctly reflecting everything that we actually have here. So that brings me to the last circulation project that I'll share today, which is an ongoing collaboration with content development, and that's our Library of Things collection. Now that summer reading is complete, Lisa and I have been working to figure out what new things we'll be adding to the collection and how we'll circulate them. My circulation technicians provide great feedback on the sustainability of checking things in and out and have been serving on a library of things committee alongside myself, Lisa, some of her content development staff, and representation from public services. The committee helps Lisa and I to vet new ideas and ensure that we haven't overlooked anything before adding those items to the collection. And we're happy with the changes that we've made so far to the selection of, of those Library of Things materials 
and are excited for a few more updates to how the collection will be displayed and shelved, which I think Lisa will speak a little bit more about. And if there's no other questions, I'll turn it over to Lisa. Uh, library of Things. This year, um, we're looking at circulating video game controllers for a variety of the consoles that, that folks have. And then also puzzles and board games are, are coming up next. Yeah. When you said you help people to job <laughs> and to do their job, I love that. For those who are new, do they have career advancement opportunities here? Like as they get really excited about their work, where, where can they go next? Yeah, there's a lot of opportunities for people. Um, we've had a history of people start here as a materials handler and then eventually become branch manager. Obviously that, and that comes with a lot of different um, push from that individual person to take that route. But within uh, the structure that we have now, someone can start at 15 hours, they can go up to a 25 hour materials handler position, then we've got the lead position, um, and then our full time technician position. If they wanna stay in circulation services, they've got all of those options. And then I've had a lot of folks who start as a materials handler and then realize they really love the children's department and then work to get their MLS or just apply to be a library assistant in any kind of specific area. Um, I've known for having a lot of my employees pilfered to other departments, so it's a fun thing though. I enjoy seeing them get to spread their wings and move on to different places. And that's good for the library, so wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. Of course. Thank you. Steph, we appreciate your efforts and all the, job, all the work that you and your staff do. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Lisa Champelli again. So welcome back, Lisa, to talk about more about con content development. So thank you. I uh, appreciate the opportunity uh, to share an update about the content development department and the work we've been doing uh, recently. I work with a fabulous team of colleagues who are dedicated to the thoughtful selection, acquisition, processing, cataloging, analysis, and deselection of materials. Uh, and I am fortunate to collaborate with the multi-talented Steph Niemeyer on a regular basis. She's really lucky to have uh, Steph as a partner in our endeavors. Uh, the content development department also, like circulation services, operates in more of a behind the scenes role, but we're on the flip side of cir circulation services, working to identify what titles to add to our collections and get them ordered, received, cataloged, and ready for shelving. The other essential part of our collection development work, as we've noted in the collection development policy, is weeding the collection, identifying the titles that are outdated or no longer of interest to our patrons and removing those from the shelves in order to make room for the new. This work is completed by a team of 10. Pam White submits all of our purchase orders and invoices for payment. Kristen Owsley receives and prepares for cataloging the variety of materials that come into this building on a nearly daily basis. TD is our lead cal cataloger and we expect to have an assistant cataloger join us soon. Jared Thompson assists with data reporting and collection maintenance projects, including digitization, uh, and, and also helps uh, streamline our regular weeding schedule. Beth Hagen is part-time, uh, working to complete any final labeling of items that are needed before they go to be checked in and shelved. And our selector librarians are the ones who essentially set everyone else's work in motion. At the start of this year, we added a fourth selector librarian to our team, enabling Martha Odia to focus her work on the increasingly popular graphic novel and manga collections for all ages. And Martha also selects for uh, the fiction and nonfiction titles for young adult and teen audiences. Previously, Martha uh, selected for those collections in addition to choosing all fiction and nonfiction materials for children from birth to age 12. So she had a lot on her plate and did a great job with it. Uh, but now our newest selector, Emmy Champion, chooses materials for children allowing Martha to be able to really invest some more time in investigating uh, trending titles and, and issues and graphic novels and the, and the uh, genres that, that she focuses on. And Martha's research led to a decision earlier this year to start a separate collection for manga-influenced comics, uh, which resemble manga but originate in countries other than Japan. 
and with the ability to concentrate on print, material, print materials for our youngest users, Emmy was able to attend to some of the needed updates in the, in the children's collections uh, that, that Steph referenced earlier. Completing our selection team, we have Manda Lofmiller, who selects fiction and nonfiction print materials for adult audiences, and Brandon Rome, who selects nonprint and digital media for all ages. So it's quite a range. Um, we're seeing that children's print materials have some of the highest checkout rates of our collections, but we continue to see high demand for popular new releases uh, of adult fiction in particular. For example, one of the 2024 Read with Jenna book club titles uh, called All the Colors of the Dark uh, currently, or when I checked it yesterday, had 40 holds on it. And the historical fiction novel The Women by Kristen Hanna, a New York Times bestseller, has uh, 37 holds on the regular print edition and then another 16 holds on the large print format. Um, in your monthly uh, report, uh, there's a chart that shows you know, usage of the collections, uh, separating out print from digital media and then combining the two together. And so you can see in the circulation charts that total checkouts of print materials has declined over the years. And we have yet to return to the pre-pandemic highs of 2019. And at this point, it seems that that's unlikely to really ever come back to that point. And that's a trend that is occurring across the nation and libraries uh, everywhere, not just at MCPL. Uh, or, you know, as far, as far as I know, I haven't researched all, or haven't surveyed every single library, <laughs> but, but that's what I'm reading. Um, the pandemic, as we all know, was a huge disruptor in so many ways. It broke the habit of the, of, that individuals and families had of coming to the library on a regular basis. And when the only way to access information was online, it was opportunity for a lot of people to discover how convenient it was uh, to, to be able to do that. And many found that it was actually a preferable format for them. Uh, so since the pandemic, we, we have seen usage of digital media resources continue, continue to grow. So the challenge that this pre presents for us and for libraries across the nation is how do we stretch our budget to buy enough materials to support the demand for those popular bestseller titles uh, that everyone's talking about in both print and digital formats because we try to be responsive to where we're seeing the community demand and when we have holds come in on the print copies and on the digital copies, um, we don't necessarily know that it might be one person placing multiple holds on different formats just to see what comes in first. We're trying to be responsive and make it as uh, as quick, you know, to be able to get materials to people as quickly as possible has has been one of the things that that we strive for. Um, so, you know, trying to figure out how am I going to, you know, stretch my my budget dollars to be able to accommodate, in a sense, um, the the preference for print and the and the demand for digital. Um, and we're also seeing uh, higher prices on digital media. They cost more than the print format. Uh, and we see this type of cost discrepancy, for example, in the in that popular bestseller bestseller title of the women uh, that book lists for $30 in hardback with our primary vendor, Baker & Taylor. With the discount that Baker & Taylor extends to us, we can purchase that print title for about $17. And then we own that physical book and we can circulate it uh, for as long as it remains in good condition or as, a, as long as it's indicating um, that we have community members interested in it. And on average, libraries estimate uh, that they should be able to get 50 checkouts from a, um, from a, from a print item. And, and that's really ballpark. <laughs> uh, the ebook copy of this title costs MCPL $60 per copy. And it includes a, a licensing restriction that limits its availability to a 24 month time period. So after two years, that title is no longer available. It's essentially withdrawn from the collection. And if we want to make it available again, we have to buy another copy. Um, to purchase the women in book on CD uh, costs $45 per copy. The digital audio book of this title that comes with a permanent license costs $60. And that can really uh, vary. You know, sometimes we're seeing permanent licenses uh, for an e-audio book that might cost as, as much, you know, as $100 and $120. It can really, it can vary. And those prices are set by the publishers. Uh, as the name suggests, a permanent license, license means that 
our use of that digital copy does not expire after a set time period or as some licensing terms stipulate after so many checkouts. And so this is, you know, you can kind of understand a physical book, it's gonna wear out eventually, but, but trying to help people understand that sometimes we're, that we're required to withdraw an ebook copy because it's been checked out so many times. It's not worn out, it was just the licensing terms that were associated with that particular title. So we strive to make materials available to our patrons as quickly as possible and, f and have always had kind of a holds to copy ratio in place. And we um, currently follow a guideline that if six people are waiting for a copy, we'll purchase uh, uh, another copy. And that rule has been, is being applied to both print and digital materials. Uh, to help meet community demand for the women, for example, we own 15 print copies, 24 in ebook format, and 22 as digital audiobooks. And our dis at our discounted price, those 15 physical books cost $255. The 24 ebooks cost us 1,440, and the 22 e audiobooks cost $1,319. And I, I share this just to really highlight the pricing of these materials is different for libraries than they are for individual consumers. So, you know, individuals can go to Amazon and buy an ebook and audiobook and it's not going to it's going to, you know, be at a lesser cost, at a lower price. Um, and I also share this because I would like to commend Brandon Rome, uh, who is really masterfully navigating the licensing issues that come with these uh, with digital media. So you know, having to think about what's the anticipated demand going to be for a particular title. If I spend one hundred and fifty dollars on an e audiobook, is it going to be of interest to more than one person? How long are we going to have it in the collection? <laughs> Could someone enjoy it in print? You know, you're really weighing you know a couple a couple different factors. Um, nationally, libraries continue to advocate for the need for more sustainable pricing models for digital media. And uh, just a week or so ago, the Digital Public Library of America, which has been kind of an advocate for libraries across the country, an organization trying to work on this issue. How do we make uh, ebooks and digital media more accessible and affordable to the public at large? Um, they just announced that they've reached an agreement with independent publishers of titles uh, who are going to make copy ebook and audiobook copies of the titles that they publish, that they're going to make them available with permanent licenses at an affordable price that other libraries could purchase through a platform that's called the Palace Project. Um, so it's just kind of a way to bring some independent publishers together to try to offer some leverage, uh, negotiating leverage, or, or we've got other options <laughs> leverage with some of the big five publishers who are really kind of controlling the market for ebooks and audiobooks, the um, HarperCollins, Macmillan, Simon & Schuster uh, sizes of publishers. Um, so you know that effort is out there in in the public library word, world to figure out how to make you know e digital media more affordable and uh, accessible to everyone. Um, and in the meantime, as we have more and more patrons seeking to borrow materials in digital format, we are gradually shifting our budget allocations in that direction to meet that demand, while remaining mindful of the other types of materials um, that our patrons continue to seek, whether it's newspapers, magazines, iPads. Um, you know, we, we're wanting to uh, continue to provide the choices that, that our community um, asks for. Uh, and we are always thinking about how can we make it as easy as possible for our patrons to access library materials and resources. And so last year, that was one of the reasons we invested in the digitized edition of the HT in order to make our local history easier to access. In July, uh, the editions included in that collection uh, were, ac were accessed, you know, there was a usage indicator uh, uh, for, uh, that occurred 558 times <laughs> in the month of July. So, you know, it means that someone uh, tried to, you know, indicated that they were going to that source and, and you know, we, we don't know exactly what, what it was that they were choosing to read or, or discover, but um, 
and trying to track usage on data on e-library resources, as Greer knows, is, is uh, yeah, it's hard to compare apples to oranges just for the different, or hard to compare apples to apples, <laughs> uh, just for the different ways that the, the platforms work sometimes. Um, and we also recently added a new online database to help make it easier for our staff and patrons to find a variety of legal forms. And then later this year, uh, as Steph mentioned in the, the question uh, asked, we are looking to add some more things to the Libra Library of Things collection uh, and kind of um, uh, uh, capitalizing on our gaming initiatives and recognizing how playing games really plays uh, an important role in learning and socialization. Uh, so seeking to add uh, some of those types of materials to, to the Library of Things. So those are just a few of the examples that, um, of the different ways that we're developing collections to meet the current needs and interests of our community members. Well, um, two things. Before you weed things out, do you kind of move them to other, the other branches? We will do that on occasion. That is something that the selectors will look at. So if, uh, you know, an indicator that we have more copies than we need, that they're, um, uh, or, you know, or that, yes, for example, when we, you know, if we're purchasing uh, like 15 copies of that popular bestseller, uh, the women, eventually the holds list is going to go down. And we won't need 15 copies sitting on the shelf downtown. So, so the selectors will come back and look at should some of those one or two, you know, move to a branch location. Um, so that is something that, that we will look on look at on occasion before just withdrawing an item. I've had several, not several, but a few people share with me they love the Southwest. However, they like browsing and they're not seeing as many changes over there as they yeah. like. So I didn't know whether, so in other words, just share that they need to come over here more? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, or I'm sorry, I shouldn't answer yes. I wasn't sure I heard, heard the question correctly. Well, that they just seem to, they like to browse and a lot of the changes, they don't see as many different kinds of books. They would just like to see more books there. Right. So I didn't know right. if and the, they're going to yeah. be circulating or changing things. So that, that is something that we continue to talk about, and it's, you know, part of that, um, part of the budget accommodations and also part of the uh, w looking at what is, how do we share materials most efficiently. Um, and one of the things we're trying to keep in mind is that if there's a copy at the Southwest branch and a, another patron wants it, or, you know, or someone at Ellisville wants it, it, has to, it comes back downtown first and then goes to Ellettsville. So, um, so we are certainly working toward putting, getting more variety in, more variety of titles into the Southwest branch. Um, it's when you, when you start a new collection, you want to allow room for grow, growth and you want to allow room for learning what the people who use that location most often are asking for. So absolutely, there will be uh, more you know, diversity of titles and things coming to that collection. But I also share the caveat that we're looking systemically as well. If they said, I just like to, to browse, yeah. is what I've been hearing. Yeah. Um, second comment, and I don't know whether this would be a big legal issue, but if we were able to purchase the digital, mm -hmm. and another library had not had it, and then of course I know they want the most popular things at that time, but would there be any way of playing, you know, you, I'll give you mine here and you will switch for yours? Uh, yeah, it's, yeah, so that's an interesting question and something that Brandon is really trying to uh, pay attention to in um, the titles that are ordered through OverDrive and that then become available as part of the Indiana Digital Library collection. And that is a collection that is shared with 200 other member libraries in Indiana. Um, and so when we purchase a title and it gets added to that collection, our patrons get priority of um, 
if they place a hold on that title, our patrons are kind of first in line for it. Um, but it is something that other you know, patrons at other libraries also have the ability to borrow. And so the f reverse happens as well. Um, pardon me? It can eventually cost less if, you know, if you look at, uh, if, if we factor in kind of sharing, you know, that we're, that we're helping kind of the greater good. <laughs> Um, and that is uh, one of the questions that we're looking at right now. We have a larger percentage of patrons who use the Indiana Digital Library than some other libraries do. So there's kind of an expectation that we should be investing more in that. Um, and that was one of the you know, kind of considerations for um, dropping one of our other e-library platforms was to just try to support where we're seeing the usage occurring most and to try to get the best investment, return on investment as we can. It's, yeah, I hope I'm explaining this correctly because it's, it's a complicated, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Maybe I'm not doing this right, but when I check out a digital copy, I only go to Libby. Okay. And there are other places to go to get digital copies other than Libby? Yes. Oh, well. <laughs> and this is. This I didn't know that. I mean, <laughs> I'm doing it wrong. Well, I'm doing one way. <laughs> so, so how would you get a digital copy then if it's not through Libby? So the other major platform that we support uh, for ebook and audiobook borrowing is called Hoopla. And, uh, and, and, Hoopla has ebooks, audiobooks, uh, movies, music, television, um, Overdrive. Also, I've uh, tried to help some folks learn that you can also get uh, digital magazines, you know, through um, through Overdrive. Uh, but Hoopla is another major platform that we have, um, and we're exploring some different borrowing options in there. Again, to try to present some more choices to our patrons and figure out how, uh, you know, as we're having having more people learn about, you know, different ways of borrowing digital media, um, we're wanting to make sure that we've got enough to support more users and. Um, and so, you know, it's one thing if you're trying to make sure one person gets a lot, <laughs> but we're trying to make sure more people can get some. So does that make sense? So the two ways to borrow digitally from Monroe County Public Library are Libby and Hoopla. Mm -hmm. And those are the two primary ways, but we do also offer digital media through some other e-library resources. Uh, so, for example, for graphic novel fans, there's another database that we subscri subscribe to called Comics Plus, okay. and that has a whole range of you know graphic novels and manga titles that are, are readily available. Um, so it's a it's a different type of of borrowing, and we're not adding you know material. We're not adding titles to that database. But for people who uh, are seeking that type of content, it's another place that they can go to, to look for, uh, for graphic novels. So your selectors would then add them to the Hoopla or to the Libby? Right, yes. Okay. Yes, okay. So, uh, so our selectors can add titles to uh, Libby. And um, you know, just uh, recently, we changed the um, borrowing and selection method in Hoopla so that it is possible for us to add titles to, to okay. Hoopla. And the other uh, nice feature about the change that happened recently with Hoopla is that it lets patrons place a hold on or lets them submit a suggestion for purchase through Hoopla. So, you know, that's often, you know, a deciding factor for the selectors is how many people are asking for this title? Sure. Um, and Brandon was just uh, showing me how uh, he can communicate back through the Hoopla platform so that if somebody's asking for a title that we own in OverDrive, he can send them a message, he can send them a response with the link to the title in OverDrive. But he's also looking at the holds list, you know, the holds queues, maybe it makes sense to buy it in Hoopla as well. 
Um, so it's really, you know, kind of starting a learning process for how, how do we use this borrow, you know, selection and borrowing platform uh, mm -hmm. to, to, to the best advantage for everybody. And one final question. I'm sorry. No, that's so fine. So in, in these uh, digital platforms, the length of time you have the item is two weeks. Is that because that's what OverDrive recommends, mm. whereas the, the physical one is three weeks? I'm just wondering. Right, yeah. So if I remember correctly, we do have the ability, that was a question that Hoopla asked us, how long do we want to you know, set the borrowing term? So I, I'm pretty sure we could adjust that in OverDrive as well if we wanted. Um, but setting it at two weeks uh, means you're going to get some higher turnover rate. Uh, and and um, you know, and the difference with the digital media, of course, is that when that due date comes, it is gone. <laughs> yeah. You don't, and that, that can be a disadvantage. It can be an advantage. Oh, I, I forgot about it in my car. I didn't bring it in. Um, so, but so it's it's set at currently set at at that two week rate just to kind of encourage sure. um, the ability for more people to get access to that title. Yeah. Sure. Really excited about with Vega Discover, our new online catalog, is that so? You re, you, it's a really good question. Like mm -hmm. people associate eBooks with Libby Overdrive. They yeah. might associate streaming video with Hoopla. We had a challenge when we adopted Canopy back in 2018 because it was an alternative uh, video streaming platform uh, with a completely different collection. But to get patrons to think in terms of multiple e-resource platforms for the same content is challenging because your intuition says it should all be in one place. Right. Our Vega Discover offers more of that all-in-one experience if you're browsing online and you're looking for a title or an author or what have you the results tend to be grouped together regardless of format and then you can launch from that straight into whether it's overdrive or canopy or a physical item and so we're hoping that when that goes live people get used to it there's maybe less confusion about what's the platform i'm using what are the options that i have because you have a direct link to it yeah yeah exactly some because again it can be part of that habit of use you know I, i'm used to using something and, and and but also just learning about the different i mean that's something that i mean we're lucky to have the communications and marketing uh team that we do to try to help everybody learn about the wealth of materials available to them through their public library all right thank you like a get to know your library type of event Hmm. I think uh, certainly, uh, you know, I, I think the department that's doing that most regularly right now might be Vital, um, who are working on, inter you know, welcoming people just to our community. Um, and then, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, um, I mean, yeah, so I'm trying to think of some other examples, but uh, but one of the children's librarians was also just telling me about a game that she's developing through the um, Beanstack platform that is designed to help kids try out different things that the library offers. And uh, and I think that'll be, yeah, it sounds really um, intriguing way to help introduce kids to some things that maybe they hadn't thought about to or didn't realize the library offered or just hadn't tried out yet. Could that by department, I think, probably more than as an institution. So TEEN does the same thing with outreach yeah. in the schools. Outreach Services does it on a regular basis. Um, the ground floor has sort of the open house mm -hmm. Sundays once oh, a right. month yeah, yeah. just to bring people in and say, this is a new space you might not know about. So we, we do it kind of in a departmental sense mm -hmm. rather than a larger get to know MCPL with the exception of annual campaigns for Library Appreciation Month, Library Sign Up Card or Card Sign Up Month, which will be next month. Things like that are kind of where we hit that, hey, here's what the library offers you may not know about. And then uh, occasional things like the strategic plan will do that. But a larger sort of you know, comprehensive get to know your library event, I don't think is anything we've ever really yeah. considered doing. Because yeah. every time I come to these meetings <laughs> and I hear the amazing work that you all are doing, I recognize there's a disconnect. Our community members 
don't understand this. And I kind of feel like people who have touch points with libraries are for a specific reason. If you really love and have always had a connection with the library, maybe a teacher that you knew really pushed the library so you became a lover of libraries. Mm -hmm. But if you're just walking down Kirkwood and you decide, where am I going to go? How many people automatically say, I think I'll try the library today. <laughs> you know, it's a Friday. I don't have anything else to do. I'm coming to the library. Mm -hmm. It's one of the things we took away from the strategic plan survey. We kept seeing suggestions from the public that said, hey, have you thought about doing this? And we go, mm -hmm. yeah, but we do, but we do, but we mm -hmm. do. And so uh, communications and marketing uh, department, uh, we had a lot of conversations about how are we going to find those opportunities to raise the profile of some of these services? Because clearly the community doesn't mm -hmm. know everything we do unless you're in the know and you've mm -hmm. got that library connection. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The last thing I'll ask, so a, a print material reaches its 50 checkouts and now we're like, we don't really need this anymore, but we own it. Where does it go? Mm. We are so fortunate to have the Friends of the Library Bookstore. Um, and our materials, when they're withdrawn, go to the bookstore uh, for a value, uh, and they can choose. You know, there's some things if they're in really bad condition, bindings, you know, are broken, they'll go to recycle. Um, but the bookstore, they get another chance to be enjoyed by someone in the community, and um, then it also uh, provi uh, is a. Uh, the funding comes back to the library, you know, things that are purchased in the bookstore come back to the library and we uh, get to turn that around and use it for programs and, and other libraries uh, initiatives. So, so a lot of our discards do end up in the Friends of the Library bookstore. Are you a super fan of the library? Like, learn some cool factoids? Because I, I feel the same way. Like, I, I would say I'm a super fan of the library, but I do always learn something really fascinating at these meetings. So um, anyway, thanks for sharing that. And um, I appreciate you going into detail about um, the cost for libraries of eBooks. Like, mm -hmm. every question that I had as you were going through this thing, mm -hmm. then you followed up and mm -hmm. answered it through your presentation. So thank you. I've been really curious about what the impact of that is. I've heard about globally what that is like, yeah. um, but have been curious about what it's um, what the effects are here for MCPL. So thanks for going, doing that deep dive. I appreciate it. Certainly. Thank you. And back in the day, mm -hmm. I'm saying back in the day, like <laughs> 12 years ago, <laughs> didn't it used to be that digital products were cheaper than the print copies? Hmm. Or am I making that up? Hmm. I feel like, in, and maybe it's maybe the difference is it's it was cheaper for the individual than for the library. Because I remember in college uh -huh. saying things like, "Don't buy the print copy, get the digital, because oh. it'll save you a lot of money when mm. trying to buy books for the semester." Mm. So has this completely changed? Uh, I, or are you talking through a library? Individuals, yeah. I think. But is is the distinction that? It's always been cheaper for individuals than it has been for libraries. Are we seeing the shift in both spaces? Hmm. I'm not entirely sure. Okay. Um, uh, I guess I'm thinking, you know, depending on where you were buying that digital media, and, and certainly initially there may have been lower costs for consumers because, you know, places like Amazon are just trying to do the same thing that that we're talking about, how do I help people learn that this is an option for them? So there may have been like some incentive, you know, pricings initially for consumers. Um, and I think, uh, you know, publishers are, have also been trying to figure out, oh, this is, this is sticking around, <laughs> digital media isn't going away. <laughs> so how do we continue to earn a profit? So that's part of it, I'm sure, I would think. All right, thank you very much. Hey. Thank you so much, Lisa. Hey, we've come to the portion of our meeting for public comment. Do we have any members of the public that would like to come forward and address the board? Okay. Seeing none, do we have a motion to adjourn our meeting? So moved. Second. Okay, all in favor of adjournment, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. The ayes have it, we are adjourned. <laughs>